Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week, I'm joined by Chef Dave Pint. He is the owner, founder of Burnt Ends Hospitality Group, most notably the Burnt Ends Restaurant, which is in Singapore. We had a great time in Singapore probably about five years ago or so now. This was kind of one restaurant that was on my wife's list. Uh, she was never able to eat there a couple times that she was there for work. Just the reservations just sold out as immediately like as they went on sale. Like It's one of those, if the reservation book opens at midnight, as soon as you hit like 12.02, like sold out for, you know, that month or two months or whatever they're opening. So super popular restaurant, super innovative restaurant, and one of the most important restaurants in Singapore. Singapore's food scene has exploded. When we were there just five years ago, they didn't even have a three-star Michelin restaurant. They have a Michelin guy and they've had it, I think, since maybe 2017 or something in that, 2016, somewhere in there that they originally got it. But they didn't have a three Michelin star restaurant and now they do. The three Michelin star restaurant is Odette. My wife has been there, but uh, I have not. Singapore was just, you know, a place that's got an awesome food scene. There's a whole wide, just diverse group of people doing different cuisines from all over the world. You can find anything and everything there. You can find Indian, Chinese, Korean, sushi, Japanese, uh, you know, Australian cuisine, kind of new wave, fine dining. You can find casual, you know, they had a hawker stall, which is just a little food stall that had chicken rice, which uh, they got a Michelin star at one point. So I think it was like the cheapest, you know, Michelin meal that you could get. And it was, I don't know, like five or seven bucks. And, you know, Singapore is just an amazing place that I got to go to. Uh, so I really wanted to have somebody on from Singapore at some point on this podcast and reached out and Dave was down to do it. So we got it set up and got it recorded. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with Singapore, it's pretty much on the equator. It is hot. It is humid. They have a fantastic uh, subway system that's air conditioned. They have some odd laws. Uh, you're not allowed to chew gum. So everything is super clean. They're super modern. Crime is basically non-existent. Uh, it's 70 cents on the dollar compared to the U.S. Uh, in terms of currency exchange. So basically your dollar goes a longer way there in Singapore. It's super modern, super Western. They have basically the best airport in the world there. If you've never been, it's a great entry point into the world of Asia before you get into places where you need to know some of the local language or trying to get around might be a little bit difficult because not everything is in English or there's no signage in English, stuff like that. You don't have to worry about that in Singapore, but you still get exposed to a lot of cool cultural things. So that's kind of one of the reasons why I loved it. It feels like you're in a tropical place because of the weather, but you're also like in New York City, but you don't have the trash smell of New York City and there's a bunch of stuff to do and you can get everywhere and you don't need a car and it's all that stuff. So Dave was awesome enough to come on. They are 13 hours ahead of us at this point too as well. So when we recorded this, it was my nighttime, his morning time there in Singapore. And we just talked about his career. He's from Australia, so working in Australia, how he wound out in the UK, staging all the places that he did, opening Burnt Ends as a pop-up, how it wound up in Singapore, how he landed funding for it, opening the restaurant, the publicity it got, the accolades, moving to a new space, a bigger space, a newer space, challenges with that still too as well, you know, why they opened the bakery, the wine arm of the whole operation, the different restaurants that they have. They also have this thing called Meat Smith, which is more of a barbecue. And they have it, it's within the hospitality group, but there's a handful of locations. They got one in Qatar, they got one in Jakarta, and a couple in Singapore too as well. And he also opened a restaurant in the Maldives, uh, which we talk about, you know, that opportunity and why he took that on too as well. So it's just a great episode. It covers a lot of places that we don't normally cover because, you know, we haven't had a whole lot of international chefs on just because it's harder with time changes and stuff like that. And everybody's busy and there's different holidays and all that stuff too as well. So looking to have more international people on, you know, we've had a, a couple of people in Canada and stuff like that. And really Marcin over in Paris was kind of our first international and Dave's kind of our, our second where it's outside the North American continent. So looking to have more people on so we can kind of get a better scope of their career path and how they wound up doing what they're doing and the different roads that they took compared to, you know, people in America or people that are cooking in America too, as well. So you can follow Dave on Instagram. His Instagram handle is at dpinto, so D-P-Y-N-T-O. You can also follow all their restaurant accounts. So it's at Burnt Ends Hospitality Group, at burntends.sg, at burntends.barsg, at burntends.sellers.sg, at burntendsbakerysg, 
at Meatsmith, at Meatsmith.doha, at Meatsmith.sg, at Meatsmith.id, at Meatsmithexpress.sg, and then also at The Ledge by Dave Pint is the restaurant in the Maldives. So you can follow all those, whatever you guys want to follow. They all kind of link to each other. If you get to the hospitality group one, you'll be able to find it. But you can also follow us on Instagram at Spoon Mob. We're on all the other social medias, uh, basically either Spoon Mob or Spoon Mob one on all those, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, or TikTok, whatever. Check out our website, SpoonMob.com. We have links to all the different episodes up there, different pages for all of our guests too as well. Updates since they've been on the podcast, we incorporate food photos too. Those all make their way to Instagram eventually but they arrive on the website first. You can write in questions, comments, feedback through the contact portal or email us directly, spoonmob at yahoo.com. And also make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. New episodes drop on Thursdays. They hit YouTube a week later. So, But without any further delays, here is my conversation with Chef Dave Pint, the owner and founder of Burnt Ends and Burnt Ends Hospitality Group in Singapore. Thanks again for taking some time out of your morning. Like we were kind of talking about, you are currently 13 hours ahead of us uh, here in the U.S. I have been to Singapore. I have not eaten at your restaurant yet. Uh, My wife has been there probably five or six times. She was just not one of the lucky ones that was able to get a reservation because you guys always just sell out right away. But she's been to a couple other restaurants, you know, Odette and Jan and a few others. Singapore is awesome. I had a great time when I was there checking out just all the different stuff there's to do and we're eating at a bunch of places while she's working and everything. So that was probably five or so years ago, five and a half years ago now. I mean, obviously there's a couple of years that kind of get lost because of COVID and the lockdowns and stuff, but you guys moved to a bigger location recently and everything. And I want to get into that because you've opened some different concepts and stuff too. But I always like to start at the beginning with everybody. How did you first get involved with cooking? Because originally you're from Australia, you're from Perth, right? Yeah. A mate had a kitchen hand job, so pot washing job when we were at high school. And I was like, yeah, I kind of need some more money. On weekend, I used to wash dishes at a local Italian restaurant. So that's sort of, I guess, where it all began. Was this true authentic Italian or is this like giant menu Italian that also makes pizzas? It wasn't giant menu Italian, but it wasn't authentic Italian. I think what Australians do really well is they bastardize every single cuisine and make it kind of like Italian, Australian, Chinese, Australian, Malay, Australian, French, Australian. And so it always has that sort of hate to Australia with either produce or style of eating or a little bit dumbed down maybe or whatever it is. And it was kind of one of those, but it had a wood-fired pizza oven, which I think is notable. So it was done sort of properly, but in that bastardized Australian way. You go to TAFE, which is a West Coast Institute of Training for Culinary School. When did you know that you wanted to make a career and actually go to culinary school for the profession? I don't think it was like oh, this is like, I'm doing this. It kind of sort of just happened. And I think finished high school, didn't want to go to university. So I picked up more shifts in the restaurant. And then one of the apprentices fell sick. And I was like, you know what, I can do that. And so I took that role. And then the head chef was like, hey, you need to go do an apprenticeship. And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Why not? Sort of snowballed from there. Where did you decide on doing your apprenticeship? Was it specific schools that you could choose from or they were just like, hey, you got to go work in a restaurant and this person's got to sign some paperwork that like you actually work here for a while? Not university. It's like a local college for trades and stuff. That's the only option. So unless we went overseas or interstate, which I don't think was really an option at the time, you have one option. Take it or leave it. I ask this to pretty much anybody who's a chef and comes on the podcast, you know, if someone in your kitchen now would ask you, hey, you know, I want to be a chef one day, I want to open my own restaurant. Do you think I should go to culinary school? What would you tell them? I think it's a tricky one. Now being up in Singapore, we've got schools like CIA and they give you some really good foundations, but some really good networks as well. But you've got to invest a shitload of money into that. And so you've got to have money to start with, right? So that's one sort of play. The other play is like, if you work your fucking ass off and you work in great restaurants, what do you need a school for? I think there's two sides of it and two different routes people can take and people just got to figure out which one suits them the best. But I don't necessarily think school's bad or school's the only way. Do you finish culinary school then before you moved to Sydney to start working? Yes, I did. I got signed off a little bit early by my uh, boss at the time, which I'm very appreciative for. Pissed off to Sydney to work at Tetsuya's. 
was that always something that you wanted to do was go to the other side of the country to either Melbourne or Sydney and work? Or did that just kind of happen organically? It kind of happened organically. I got an opportunity to do a stage over at Tet Studios uh, while I was still an apprentice. And then, you know, you sort of go and live overseas for a couple of weeks or interstate for a couple of weeks on your own. And you're just like, holy shit, there's a big wide world out here. And you get exposed to these other amazing young chefs as well who are like super passionate and talented. And you're just like, I've got to be there. Was Tetsuya a restaurant that you had on your list of places you wanted to work and wanted to stage at? For sure. When I was sort of growing up, it was like one of the best in the country. And, you know, he had a formidable reputation. And he was the guy that was like not super traditional because he did sort of this French, Japanese, Australian kind of cuisine, but he was leading the path. He had an incredible team behind him. And it was just like, you know, if you want to be in one restaurant in the country, that was going to be it. So then after a couple of years, you wind up going back to Perth, right? You wind up working at a musée, yeah. What led to you returning home? Because normally, like, once you kind of leave and start cooking somewhere, the last place you want to go is back to kind of where you started, where you're from almost a lot of times. You know what? It was pretty much exactly like that. We had some family stuff that we needed to sort out and hence the move back and did that for a year, got everything sorted and then got on the plane again. What kind of style of cuisine were they cooking there? I guess it was kind of like modern French fine dining. So his background was the greenhouse in the UK, which is like a lot of cooking, a lot of menu changes. The biggest difference between there and like Tetsuya's was you actually had to cook everything a la minute. So there was a lot of like physical cooking and like there's something that you really enjoy about actually having to cook. It's not easy and it might not come out perfectly, but there's something that you really love about cooking. What led to you deciding to go overseas? You're in Australia. You could have gone back to Sydney. You could have gone to Melbourne. You know, Melbourne, a lot of people consider is the food capital of the country. But you decided to go all the way to Denmark and stage at Noma. At that point in time, Noma was like top 10 in the world. And it really piqued my interest about what he was doing in terms of being sort of like hyper local and very creative. You know, if there's one restaurant in the world, that was the one that I was like, that's where I want to go and learn from. Did you uh, just shoot him an email? How'd you get in? Letters were gone by then. It was all on email. I think it was quite a lengthy process to get in. It was like an email, then a bit of back and forth. And then there was like a time slot, like a period of time that you could come. And then there was a few conditions on it. It wasn't like, can I come? And then it was like, yes, go kind of thing. It was like a bit more premeditated and planned. Yeah, we've had a couple of people on this podcast that stage there. They've said like, you know, there's 50 to you know 70 people in the kitchen. What did they have you doing when you were there? Were you in like the boathouse that was doing all the experimental stuff? But then they also had people kind of basement prep area. So what did you do when you were staging there for four months? The plan was to go for three months. I quit after two weeks, ended up staying for four months. Basically, what happened is I got put on a section, like the snack section downstairs, and it's so intense and it's so sort of managerial, a lot of organization. And I turned around to the the head chef at the time, Sam Miller, and I was just like, I didn't come here to work for you guys. I came here to learn. If I'm going to get stuck on a section, mate, I can do that anywhere in the fucking world, but I'm not going to learn what I want to learn. So he talked and he was like, look, if you really want to learn, you've got to commit to this many months and I need you on this section for a couple more weeks or whatever and then we'll move you around so you can get what you want out of it. That's basically what happened. Got to move around and got to see a lot of different things and work in a lot of different places and ended up doing learning how to make bread over there under Daniel Texter on the day off. So I was like became a six day week and I think I really got the most out of my time over there. Is that a normal occurrence that either other people that you've talked to that have staged at restaurants or even that have staged at Noma where you can kind of get pigeonholed into this one section and they're kind of looking for you to speak up and be like, hey, I want to do more. I'm trying to learn and stuff like some restaurants could use that in theory as like a test to see like they wanted to be here. Like how bad do they want to be here? I don't think it's necessarily a test. It's definitely one of those things where, and I feel this even running our kitchen now, it's like people can get what they want out of it, but they have to talk. If you don't tell anyone that you're not happy picking herbs for 16 hours a day, then you're going to be left picking herbs because the herbs still need to get fucking picked. It's easy for them if you don't say anything because they get their job done. If you as an individual have something that you want to get out of it, you do need to talk up. After that, you wind up staging in Spain, right? Asador, Extabari. How'd you wind up there? 
time at Noma was coming to an end and it's like, oh, where do I go next? What do I want to learn? What do I want to see? Talking, talking, talking. And, you know, this guy was like, hey, uh, you should go check out this barbecue restaurant in Spain. It's pretty good. And in my head, I'm like, didn't really have anywhere else to go. And I was like, yeah, fucking sounds cool. But in my head, I'm like, actually, how good can barbecue be, right? So I don't think at that period as what well, end of 2010, barbecue wasn't considered a thing, right? And it wasn't very widely known that barbecue could be a really good restaurant. I went with an open mind. and was like, yeah, fuck it. Like, go to Spain, have a great time, learn something. And hopefully it's as good as what everyone said. Pretty mind-blowing. And that's kind of where your passion for cooking with fire really comes from, right? Is that experience working there? I wouldn't say that. Every house we moved to as a kid, my dad would rip out the gas barbecue and put in a wood-fired barbecue. So it's sort of like part of my childhood cooking with wood fire because my dad loved it. That place was the place that sort of said, you can do this as a real restaurant. When you're working there, is it different stylistically in the kitchen than other places you had worked? Is it more casual or is it still along that line of this upper echelon fine dining kitchen environment? It's a bit tricky because it's not run like the neat, clean, precise, super intense, three Michelin star, two Michelin star, world 50 best restaurant. It's care and dedication to products and cooking of them was equal if not above actually and so the care that they take with their products is better than anywhere else that i've seen so it's kind of like you'd expect that from like a three michelin star restaurant but i don't think three michelin star restaurants have that ability to do that because you know of its location of its geography of its history of its relationships it all comes together in this tiny little town called ash bay then after you stage there you wind up going to london right st john bread and wine you wind up working there how'd you wind up there was that by design or was that just a recommendation from somebody else like hey you should check this place out a lot of talk about it i think what i wanted to learn out of st john bread and wine is sort of like that whole ethos of nose to tail cooking and how you go about the process of you know cooking a whole animal basically like in its different parts and how you manage that process and how you make it all delicious and you know i wanted to understand why people love this restaurant that serves so much offal so it was like yes i want to go there i want to start there i want to learn when you're starting at these three places was there any point where you thought to yourself we all do this when we're traveling yeah i could live here i could open a restaurant here or were all of them just kind of like i enjoy my time here but i don't really see myself being here permanently for five ten years whatever so i think when i got to london it could have ended up staying there i mean we did open burn ends there originally so i think it would have been an option to continue and stay on there at some point i think the issue with spain was we're in the middle of fucking nowhere and i don't think i'm that suited for a quiet life were there any restaurants that were on your list to stage at that you didn't get a chance to or did you just want to do kind of the three it was actually really organic. It was kind of like, it was at Noma first, and then it was like, oh, what are we going to do next? Then it was Echabari. And, you know, I went from staging to working, so I, I was able to get a little bit more money. And then it was like, London was stage and work, and then into work. And, you know, I got to do a lot in those times, but it was kind of like, there was never a plan. It wasn't like, this is my five-year plan. And I still don't have one, so I'm probably not the best organizer. Before you wind up opening the first iteration of Burn Ends, you help a chef, Nuno Mendez, open the Loft Project, which was like an underground supper club. How did you get involved with that? At St. John Bread and Wine, I was also doing pop-ups with the Young Turks. And then Nuno Mendez was at running a place called Via Jante. He was also doing the Loft Project. He was already up and running by that stage. It was sort of like actually towards the end of it. He just needed someone to manage that process for him and sort of get everything organized. And so I was like, you know, I needed money and it paid cash and life was good. Was it in a way like a catering chef? Like, you know, they have these different people kind of running through, but you're kind of the glue that keeps it all working together between what they're trying to execute, but then the facility that you're working in. Exactly. And it was sort of like, it's a very crash course in business management for restaurants as well. Cause like you're managing the finances, you got budgets. It's like, you really, you know, you've got to get this much revenue. You've got to fill this many seats. You've got to book this guy plane tickets. You've got to have accommodation for them. So there's a lot like you had to sort of have a grip on when you're bringing in these chefs to cook. Where does the idea for Burnt Ends kind of come from? Because you're getting this crash course in essentially the business side of running a restaurant. You wind up having this residency 
you know, you start your concept as kind of a pop-up, you know, over the summer, where did the idea come from knowing that you could kind of execute it and how did all that come together? For the Young Turks, they were doing a lot of pop-ups. I'd always get put on the barbecue section. I was like, yeah, yeah, this, this is it, right? Barbecue. And I guess from there, it's like, oh, if we wanted to do something, it's going to be barbecue. But what that looks like, we don't know. So, you know, we were talking and talking and talking to a lot of different people. And then one of Nuno's friends, Ian, runs a roastery. He was talking to Nuno. He's like, we should do a barbecue place this summer in the front of my railway arch. And Nuno was like, oh, you should speak to Dave. So we started talking and uh, we agreed we'd do a barbecue in the railway arch. Now, the legend has it that you built the grill yourself. Yes. He told me at the end, he was like, oh, in my head, you were going to put a couple of gas barbecues in the front, a couple of trestle tables, cook a few sausages, maybe some burgers or something. And, and you know, that'd be our barbecue pop up. And I was like, no, 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 mate, I'm going to build these like monster two meter cube ovens in the railway arch and get these custom built bloody elevation grills. And we're going to cook on that all summer. I roped in a mate who was doing pizzas at the time. He actually built pizza ovens. And so he sort of helped me and helped me get everything done and told me how to do it and all that kind of stuff. So we did definitely have help, but I was laying bricks and pouring cement and and that kind of thing. Had you done anything on that like level of scale before? Was this just like you knew this was your shot? So it was like, why not just go all out? Well, it's kind of like, this is what I want to do. This is what I need to do it. What's the other option? If I did use gas barbecues, would I enjoy it? No, fuck no. If I did just use a normal cold barbecue, would I enjoy it? No. In my mind, I was like, there wasn't another option. It was just like, put your balls on the table and let's see if they, they survive. Do you remember much of anything from this time period? Because you guys were serving like 300, 400 guests a day. Like that sounds like it'd just be insane and just kind of a blur. It was a blurry summer. We did a supper club on Thursday night and then we did Saturday, Sunday from like 12 o'clock till late. It was intense, but it was a lot of fun, like a lot of fun. So then when kind of reached the end of summer, you know, it's winding down. Did you know what you were going to do? You know, you had this successful pop up, kind of have this proof of concept like, hey, this works. People want this. Did you know where you were going to go from there? Initially, we wanted to stay in the arch, but we wanted some investment to make it more legit in terms of like, you know, having better facilities to work out of because we are so busy. In my head, I'm like, look, you know, we can keep going, but this is fucking pretty rough and ready, right? And there's a small chance that someone will get upset and that'll be the end of that. And anyway, we couldn't come to an agreement with uh, the owner. And so we were like, we'll shut down. We were speaking to a few people and the plan was to come back to London and reopen something for the next summer. Somewhere in there you go to South America, right? So how do you wind up instead of going back to London to go into Singapore? Yeah, so we closed down, I think, in October when it was starting to get really cold. And uh, me and the missus, now wife, went backpacking through South America for what we planned was going to be four months. In northern Peru, we got a phone call from Peng and it was like, hey, you want to come and open a restaurant in Singapore? Did he just get your contact information from somebody that you both kind of knew or did you guys kind of know each other before? So I'd met him once before. He was the business partner for Nuno Mendez at Viajante. So he owns Town Hall Hotel. And so Nuno was traveling through Singapore on his way to Sydney to look at a property. They obviously caught up for dinner and they're having a chat. And Peng and Jeff were like, hey, we want to open this barbecue restaurant. And Nuno's like, you need to talk to my mate. And so they called me up. Did you get to finish your trip? We were meant to end up in Brazil and finish in Brazil before flying back. And we didn't make it there. Basically, you got on the first flight out of Peru, essentially. We ended up flying out of Peru and we spent a week in Singapore and, you know, obviously met the partners and, you know, looked at the site and talked about the project and got everything nutted out. And then it was like, look, actually, there's, you know, we're in South America. We really want to do Machu Picchu and we've got a commitment for my wife's old company uh, that we have to do in Bolivia for a week. And then after that, we can come. And so, yeah, we spent a week here. We're like, yep, we like it. We can do this. Why not? Went back, did Machu Picchu, did a few other things while we're, you know, sorting out like a lot of details still flew out of uh, Santiago. But prior to that, you'd never been to Singapore, right? So that was your first time. Did you even know anything about the country or? Didn't know a lot about the country, but had been here before as a kid because my parents have family friends here. And so we had stopped over and met some of the friends or whatever on the way somewhere. So as a young kid, but no real memory of Singapore prior. 
So then the restaurant officially opens in like May 2013 in the Chinatown district. What was the initial reception like? Because Singapore's got a lot of different cuisines. Barbecue is not something that I can imagine was there at that time. So you were probably the first one. Obviously, people will use grills and open flame and stuff, but your kind of style, I think you were for sure, you know, the first one in Singapore. So what was the overall initial reception like from everyone? It felt pretty positive. Generally, I think it was pretty positive and very welcoming. When did you know that, you know, you kind of had something special and not just another restaurant? Because it's a small restaurant when it first starts. Now you guys are in a bigger space, but I mean, it was, you know, mainly just counter seats, right? You know, you have your elevation grills and everything. But do you remember a point where it was like, this is something that can take me to or take, you know, what I want to do and open up these other concepts and stuff from that and branch out. Did you have that point where you knew like this is kind of the the key? Honestly, no. Good that people really enjoyed it, but there was never like a defining moment where, you know, it's like, oh, this is going to open up so many doors to do whatever. You, you know, it felt like just a lot of hard work and a lot of effort and a lot of energy to just keep this that place sort of growing and running and and moving forward. With the elevation grills that you had in there for the cuisine, is that to help control like smoke, temperature, char level, all that stuff? Like what's the purpose of your kitchen layout at that time? You nailed it. You know, we've got the combination of the ovens, which sort of we burn down the wood into into embers to use on the elevation grills. But we've also got a cold cavity where we can do like slow roasting and braises in the wood-fired oven as well. Now, were these grills ones that you made yourself or were these professionally made? They were professionally made, but I did design them and I think I was there every single day that they got built. Okay, overseeing the process to make sure it was exactly what you wanted. Yeah. You know, I think I learned a lot from having to make the first set. And so there was like little nuances about the bricks and how they get placed and the different layers that have to get put on and which order it goes in and how you cure the cement before you put on the next layer and stuff like that. And it's just making sure that all those details were sort of done. Is that because depending on how you do it, it'll affect the airflow differently? Or like, does it not retain as much heat if you do it a different way? Or what's kind of the issue? The oven breaks. It'll crack? Yeah, because I mean, you're dealing like our ovens getting up to like a thousand degrees Celsius. So if you don't sort of cure things properly, shit tends to fall apart pretty quickly. So it's really important that that whole process is done properly. Was that lengthiest part? It's definitely not the lengthiest because I think uh, it takes quite a long time to set up the restaurant, like probably eight weeks of build time. It's a 22-day build once you've got the base ready. Is that for just one or is that for the whole oven? That's for the whole oven. 22 days. So it's like, you know, obviously you can only get so much work done in the day, but you can do these steps and then this step and then you need to cure it, which takes one or two days and you do another part, takes one or two days. And there's a few firings and a few curings before you do it. And then you can't just light the fucking oven up and let it go because the heat will sort of expand things so fast, so quickly that it'll just crack everything. So you've got to be like super slow, super gentle, just warm it up nicely before you really fucking start laying into it. The original location in Singapore, that was just a counter only, right? Initially, we had a counter and one table. And then we sort of put in a back bench. Then we put in like high tables outside. And then we had a private room, but in a working space upstairs for for 10 people. With that kind of layout, that open kitchen concept, is that something that you personally enjoy working in? You know, because there's some chefs that don't like having that chef counter. I think it's become more popular, but there are some people that are like, there's somebody always like right there and you don't want to not necessarily ruin their experience, but you're very cognizant of somebody being right there watching you do your job for eight, 10, 12 hours a day. So is that kind of a a layout that you enjoy or it just makes sense from business perspective to have that? I think in that space, we didn't have a choice. Even in the railway arch, it was an open kitchen. You walk into the railway arch and the kitchen was like right there. So every single person walked past what you were doing. And I think, you know, it was quite nice because you had a lot of friends in London and, you know, they could pop in and say hi and on their way through and have a chat. But also it meant that you had to have a lot of integrity with the way you did things. When you run a team, it's easy for you to say, yeah, I've got a lot of integrity. This is how I do everything. But when it comes to the rest of the team, you know, you can't always be on top of them. But 
having that pressure from the guests, they also acknowledge that, that they can't maybe do certain habits that they could do in a closed kitchen, which I think is a very good thing. What gave you the idea to change the menu daily? Was it just out of boredom, necessity of ingredients? Let's say you order scallops, you get 40 scallops. What happens when it runs out? You're out. You can be out and you can then move on to something else. And what that means is you don't have this like rolling par of stuff that you have to have on hand and you have to order every day. And that, you know, if you don't sell it, you're fucked. Whereas if you have a sort of rolling menu, it's like, you know, you can put something on and if it works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, you know, it runs its course and it's off and you put something else on it, it becomes very organic and delivery doesn't come in. It's not the end of the world. It's like, oh, it gives a shit. Let's just put something else on. It's a little bit more work, but it gives you a lot of flexibility and allows you to sort of test things and not put all your money into one basket. Be like, this is the next best dish that every single person is going to love. 2017, you wind up winning the Asia's 50 Best Chef's Choice Award, which is voted on by your peers. Is an award like that is that more important because it comes from your peers or is it still just another award? Like you're not cooking for awards or like, it seems more prestigious to me. Like if it comes from your peers, you know, because they're the people that understand what you're doing and are also obviously impressed by it and also are competing with you to receive that acknowledgement. But some people, they don't cook for awards and awards are just awards. If anything, if you want to say awards are awards, that's a very different award. It's where like your your peers and the people that you really, really love to cook for, I like what you're doing and I like the way you go about it. And it, I think that for me, it definitely was very special. Then the next year you get a Michelin star. How did you find out? Did you have any notion that the you know, inspectors were coming in? And I think they had come in. Maybe we found out who they were. We I can't remember. But they definitely at some point asked us for a whole bunch of details. So we knew what we might be on their, their radar, but you know, Michelin the awards get announced that they're when they are or whatever, no invite to like do what we do. And then it was like I think it was a Saturday before they called up and were like, Hey, can you come to the awards? Like the gala dinner. And I'm like, Oh, Actually, no, got commitments that night. Genuinely, we had a buyout or something that I had to, the guests had booked. So I had to be at the restaurant. So my wife went instead. And then on the, we, did, we still didn't know we had won an award. On the night of, they're like, oh, congratulations, you've won an award before the award. So obviously, I called my wife and said, yeah, you definitely have to go tonight. That same year, too, you opened the first Meat Smith, which is kind of your second concept. I think it was 2015. What kind of gave you the idea to have a little bit more of a straightforward barbecue concept instead of opening another burnt ends? You know, you open this different concept that's similar, but it's different. Business partner was like, hey, we want to do an American barbecue restaurant. Do you want to help us? And I was like, yeah, fuck it. Why not? Had you had any experience with American barbecue before? Like had it visited the US, anything like that? Nothing. So it's like your interpretation essentially of American barbecue? We brought in a head chef to run it that had experience. My role wasn't like, this is my my restaurant. It's like, this is just a restaurant that we sort of part of our group, but we've got this amazing head chef and this is what it is. Are you involved in the location decisions of opening future locations? As a group, we take on a little bit more more in it and just sort of, you know, if we've got an agenda, we, we push the agenda that we want. And I think, you know, we're just like, again, the, the Australian way of doing things is a lot of it's bastardized and we can get away with it. And so that, that's very much the way we sort of want to do it because American barbecue as a technique is absolutely incredible. But the flavors from every other culture and cuisine that you can input into it is what, for me personally, is more exciting. Were you involved in the decision to open one in like a hawker stall for a period of time? Yeah. What was the idea behind that? Was that to see if you could expand it to a smaller footprint, expand the concept, but to keep a small footprint, or just to even see if the concept was worth expanding upon? What it was is like, take American barbecue, put it into a hawker stall. It was kind of like, what would that mean here? Because to have a hawker stall, it's like, generally, you have to be really fucking good at one thing. The hawker stall will fly. We got approached to do it and it was like, oh, okay, this is what we think will work. You know, we did a lot of testings, trials, tastings, and it was like, fuck it, let's give it a shot. Let's see what happens, right? 
And now I think you guys have four total locations, right? Two in Singapore and then one that just opened in Jakarta and Doha. Correct. So with each of those kind of locations, were you guys one of the ideas you had changing the menu to kind of be somewhat localized within whatever country or or neighborhood it's in? Because like one has kind of got some Indian influence, right? So we've got Little India here, which is like heavy Indian flavors, but again, bastardized. Nothing sort of like that traditional sort of authentic sort of flavors that we that people might expect. And then going into Indonesia, yes, we've got sambals and stuff like that, which is very localized. And even in Qatar, we've got like the spices and stuff that you can find down in the souks and stuff like that. I think it is about, you know, whether the guests enjoyed as much having that take on their, their flavors or whether it's something that we as a team sort of really enjoy exploring and playing with and eating is we get the results on the dishes. So it gives us the opportunity to move it around as well. So probably like one of the qualifiers for future expansion is like there has to be some good spice blends and stuff like that within, you know, your targeted market essentially, you know, cause like you mentioned, guitar has got, you know, all these amazing spices and Jakarta. So my, my question to you would be name a cuisine that's never barbecued. I guess that depends on what you quantify barbecue as. If you quantify it as just cooking over an open flame with a grill, then that's like basically everyone. Exactly. I think you're about to say it, but uh, yeah, it's sort of like every culture, every cuisine will have something that they've refined over wood-fired cooking. And whether they do that now specifically over wood, maybe we can discuss, but they have at some point cooked that maybe slightly differently over fire. People naturally gravitate over hundreds and thousands of years to cook things that they really enjoy. And gas and electricity are only very recent. So every cuisine and every culture does have that sort of nuance that you can pick up on and and explore. 2019, you get an opportunity to open a restaurant in the the Maldives. How did that happen? (laughs) Like. One of our most regular guests was the president of Hilton Southeast Asia, a guy called Martin Rink. You know, we're talking, talking, he comes in very regularly, likes what we do, I guess likes who we are. I'm guessing he took it slightly from a business point, but also from a pleasure point. And so we're talking and, you know, especially being in Southeast Asia and even Australia growing up, the best thing that you can do by a beach is have a barbecue. Everyone does it. Growing up, even as a young adult, it's like you go to Bali, they've got a whole beach dedicated to beach barbecue at Jimbaran Bay. And it was like, look, that's what we do, right? Wouldn't it be fucking cool to do a beach barbecue in the best beaches in the world? And so I, I guess that was the seeds. So the menu, is that mostly seafood then because you're on a beach? So it's, it's mostly, you know, barbecuing seafood or is it still, you know, pretty meat focused? When we went, we thought it would be a lot more seafood focused. Like we went like planning wise and I think opening menus, it was super heavy on the seafood. But what we actually found is people, people still want meat. There's definitely more seafood than what we have in Singapore, but there's not as much as I thought we would have over there. Was part of the challenge or maybe the appeal of an opportunity like this is when people hear the Maldives, they think clear blue water, beach hut on a pier or a deck that goes out into kind of the ocean, but nobody ever really thinks food. Nobody ever thinks cuisine. Like obviously those are things that you need when you're there, but the initial appeal is like, you know, this paradise, you know, scenery and everything. So was that kind of part of the appeal for you is like, we can get people to think about food potentially now too, if if we do this right. We'd gone over and done a couple of pop-ups, I think three in a row in the Maldives. And it was always like, I think we had the same thing. It was like, why can't there be better food out here? Not saying that we're the messiahs. Why can't there be better food? You know, why don't people take that extra little bit of care, put that extra bit of detail, put that little bit of pride into what they're doing and serving? You know, we were like, yeah, we can help push this agenda. Barbecue on the beach in some of the best beaches in the world. Why not? With the location of the Maldives, which is not exactly the easiest, you got to put in some effort to get there, right? So how do you maintain the same level of execution from when you're there setting up the restaurant, you know, cause I'm sure you're there for a couple months and then, you know, you come back to Singapore and probably make it there a handful of times a year, you know, and, and stuff like that. But how do you maintain that kind of same level of what your vision was initially and making sure that that stays the same in the periods that you're not there? 
I think it's about the team that you build and like passing across what you believe in. A big part of what I learned from all the stages that we did, it's not what we learned to cook or the recipes that we got. It was really about what they thought about food, the way they treated food, the way they wanted food done, the way they wanted you to think about food and the way they wanted the guests to feel when they ate the food. They're the things that hopefully distilled into our sort of little barbecue universe. And when we teaching it and we train our guys and girls this is what we believe in and if they want to go and work there they need to believe in it too and if they don't believe in it then it's never going to work so they don't work you're saying the most important part is having a clear concise you know vision you want to execute and then also having kind of a training support system in there too as well like those are kind of the two most important things exactly For expectation wise for yourself, is it different opening a restaurant in a destination like that in a hotel property versus opening your own? Do you have higher expectations or do you feel more pressure because you're representing a brand or something like that? Or is it just, I mean, it's food. They hired me to do what I do. So I'm going to do what I do. What we do is very specific. In my mind, it's like take it or leave it. In terms of like worrying about being in a brand or whatever, it's kind of like we are who we are. If you want us on board, you're taking us, you're not taking someone else. So, you know, have a think about what you want to get from us. And then you just, you need to let us do our jobs. You know, hopefully people think that's, that's good. And if you let us do our jobs, we can deliver. But if, if you create roadblocks, you know, and then the results don't come, it's not, not me, it's you guys. And unfortunately, I'm going to say something. COVID happens. Were you able to pivot to, to go food or anything like that with your restaurants or Singapore was very strict, you know, lockdown measures because they were really worried about it spreading or, or getting in and everything because it's such a small country and everybody's kind of on top of each other and everything like that too. So it's like, it's essentially the same layout as like New York City almost. And for a while, like the borders weren't really open you know, to anybody. So how did you kind of navigate the early days of the pandemic? The only option was to do takeaway. It was either that or you lose your whole team. Was it something that we wanted to do? Fuck no, definitely not. Was the choice shut down and potentially never come back or give it a red hot go? So we gave a red hot go. What was the biggest challenge with switching over to takeaway? Was it figuring out how the food will travel or, you know, how do you kind of cook what you want to cook, but also make sure that, you know, when it gets to somebody's house in 20 minutes, that it still tastes good. Like what was the biggest challenge? I think you've you've named a lot of those challenges and I think it's not necessarily the challenges because they're just like, you know, they're a problem and a solution. But I think the biggest challenge was dealing with the outcome. Initially, I was like, I don't think anyone would want a steak cooked by us, delivered to their house 40 minutes later because I couldn't think of anything worse. But I was like, you know, this is one of our biggest sellers. Let's just put it on and see what happens. And, and we sold fucking shitloads of them. But would I really want to eat that at home and pay the money that we're charging? Not really. So it was that constant battle. Really, you know, everyone was in the same position. No one could eat at restaurants. And, you know, if we wanted to keep the team, these are the things we needed to do. And now it's over. I'm really fucking glad we don't do takeaway. But for some people, they probably ordered that because it was the first time that they were probably able to try some of your food. Because your guys' reservations were, as the stories kind of go for any, you know, high profile restaurant like you guys, your reservation book opens for the next month. And if you're not on there, you know, at 11.59, when it opens at 12, like you're not getting a seat. You know, you try again, you know, next month kind of deal. So probably for a lot of people, it was the first chance that they actually got to, you know, experience what you guys were doing in some capacity. The flip side of that is, is that the experience that I want to give a new guest? And yeah, look, I understand they also understand from their side, but there's something here that doesn't sit right. Yeah. Is that the first impression that you want? Last year, you know, kind of 2021, you decided to move the restaurant, you know, to a bigger space out of Chinatown over into Dempsey Hill. What led to kind of that decision? Was it just needed more space or previous space was just going to need a lot of maintenance? Yeah. So we were coming to a crunch point, I guess. I, I think it was 2021 that we would either need to do a big renovation or we were getting too big for that space and we needed to find somewhere bigger. And then on top of that, our landlord was like, oh, we're putting up the rent. So, you know, my business partners have been hassling me about Dempsey for probably six years. And I'd always said no. And I was like, okay, rent's up. You know, what are the other options? Let's just go have a look and see what happens. Was part of the appeal too, though, that with the move, I think you guys like 
basically tripled in size and the amount of people that you could see at one time, right? No, actually. What we've done is we've taken on a, a space that's 10 times bigger than our last space. We set up a bakery that flourished over lockdown. And then we opened a restaurant where size-wise, if we seated it the same as we did in the last venue, we'd have 150 people. So three times the, the number of people. But we've actually only got 55 seats inside. We haven't fully opened the alfresco, like the undercover area, because we don't have the staff for it because of the restrictions in Singapore. And then we've got a private room, which is pretty similar to the size of the old restaurant, but we do one table of 14 people. And then we've got a bar. The restaurant is actually technically the same as the old space, but we used to do three, three and a half to four turns per night in the old place. Now we do one and a half. The actual cooking and ratio between cooking facility and seats is the same, or if not like less in terms of the number of turns. But then we've got bakery, private room, which is its own complete setup because we have our own chefs in there. We have separate front of house. It's like a mini restaurant, basically. And then we've got a bar that runs essentially separately as well. It's got its own, at the moment, it's a makeshift kitchen. We thought we could supply it from the main kitchen, but we can't. So we've had to set up another kitchen in the prep area that supplies the bar and then the bar runs separately as well. Are the menus the same across the board, obviously aside from bakery or different menus for each section? Bakery is uh, obviously bakery. The restaurant runs its own menu. And then the private room, you know, we take some of the stuff from the, the regular restaurant, but we also have dishes that are only available in the private room because we can only physically do them in the private room for whatever reasons. And then the bar actually has its own a la carte menu, but also has a, it's the only place in the restaurant that has a set menu. Oh, like a tasty menu? We've got a classics menu for a hundred bucks a head in there. And so it's all the classic dishes. And, you know, we, we put that on maybe four weeks ago now and taken off pretty well because I think it gives everyone an opportunity to sort of have a taste. But we don't have, we don't have that format where it's like for a hundred bucks a head, you're getting this. Like this is your menu. You can read it in front of you and away you go. With the bigger overall space, did you make any changes, you know, aside from the layout that you just described, but like the kitchen or is the kitchen still kind of the same concept, you know, the main kitchen? Main kitchen's the same. We've built a wood-fired bread oven in the back so we can bake our bread. And we've also made our front ovens double-sided. Was that the one thing that you wanted to change from the old? No, because we've got the private room. We needed ovens and it sort of, to me, it made a lot of sense. Just why don't you be able to open the doors from both sides? They're like four and a half ton ovens. So it's not like you can just sort of replicate them again super easily for next door. The space I read, it was like a former military barracks, like I think back in kind of the British rule days, maybe. Yeah, 1906. How difficult was it to build out that space and turn it into a functioning restaurant? Look, there'd been a couple of restaurants in the spaces before, so it was definitely doable. But, you know, they've got some conservation rules about you can't do X, Y, Z, right? But the issue was this was built in 1906. So the pillars, and they're 12 meter high ceilings. So the pillars that run up to the roof, you rub them with your finger and they fucking crumble. You can't touch it, but you can't do anything with it either because it's fucking falling apart. You know, I think that those were some of the biggest challenges. So what happens if one of the pillars crumbles? We've got to make touch it up to make sure it doesn't. But we can't attach anything to it because it'll just not allowed to touch them. So they're, they're there, but you can't touch them. They basically have to like have somebody restore them or whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, they're not so fancy that they need restoring, but they don't do anything functionally. And so they get in the way. They fuck up your space. You can't use them either. Still doing the, the daily menu changes. Has that with the bigger space made it harder to come up with new dishes because you have so much more space and or is it easier because you're still just kind of working within you know what can we put on the grill what can we put on the fire where we're at now is the new dish stuff for our for our leadership team as we've grown over the last year we've had to spend so much of our time just dealing with the growth that we probably didn't anticipate that we haven't had the time to dedicate as much to new dishes. But then having said that, we've probably put on a lot of new dishes in this year that we've been in the new space. I couldn't tell you how many, but I definitely know that we've got some great dishes that we've put on this year. What's like the craziest, you know, kind of most out there dish that you've put on the menu since opening the restaurant, both, you know, former location and, and the new one? Like the thing you just weren't sure if people would even order it, even want it, but you threw it on there anyways, just to see. Did you have anything like that? 
I've got one that we did that actually happened this year. It's not a crazy dish, but, you know, it is one of those dishes. Coming out of the pandemic, we got asked to do the main course for the Bloomberg, big Bloomberg dinner in Singapore with all the world leaders, right? Business leaders. And so we're like, they gave us the main course and it had to be a take on a Singaporean classic. And it couldn't be pork because it's not halal and it couldn't be seafood because someone did it last year. So it's like, okay, well, what the fuck are we left with? And so it was like, oh, chicken rice, right? Chicken rice is like probably the most iconic dish in Singapore. And we were like, yeah, maybe apart from chili crab, like like one of the most iconic dishes. The toast is pretty famous too. What's the... Kaya toast? I'd probably rank the chicken up there. I'd chicken, chili crab, but then Kaya toast, yeah, I can see it has that. That, that appeal just below. But so, yeah, we got tasked with this. So we, in a short time frame, we had like a four weeks or something to turn this around from like, you've got, you got to come up with this new dish. Anyway, so we came up with this chicken rice dish. It was very burn ends and it was like a lot of work and a lot of effort. And, you know, we used our Singaporean chefs to help with the flavors and profiles and everything, right? And so we do this dish, you know, this like turning around like fast. So first iterations of it. Send it to the uh, events manager who's coordinating everything. She's like, she turns around and goes, this looks like a sandwich. You need to try harder. You know, we're still a bit stressed from moving into the new venue and stuff. Anyway, I tell them to fuck off. We don't do the dinner with them. I'm like, I, we're, this is never going to work. If you think this dish is a sandwich, then this is never going to work. So anyway, Bloomberg fucks off, right? And so anyway, we, we were like, oh, because we believed in the dish. Like our whole team believed in the dish. And so we started, we served it to a couple of people and then they started reordering it. And then some guests start coming in and they're like, and this is all now went from the, maybe it was the old old venue and then into the new venue. And so now in the private room, it's like, it's our most requested dish in the private room, chicken rice by a barbecue restaurant. Ingredient wise, are you primarily sourcing ingredients from Australia or is it more about just getting the best stuff that you can from whatever's kind of in proximity? Best from wherever we can. You're big with sustainability. That's a big cause for you, I was reading up on. So how do you balance that where you can get all this great stuff, but it all pretty much has to be flown in? Carbon footprint, sustainability, like how do you kind of balance all this? It's tough. I think in terms of bringing stuff in, we're in Singapore. There's actually no other option. And, you know, if if people want to be like, hey, they want to have a discussion about this, it's kind of like, look, you drive a car, you get on a plane, you do this, you do that. Don't turn around to me and tell me that I'm really doing the wrong thing when in Singapore, there's no option. You know, we don't have farmland. We don't have cows grazing. We don't have all this, right? So it does have to come from somewhere. I heard a story, I won't name the venue, to get from this one supplier, it took 13 hours on a truck to get to the restaurant. And I'm like, I can get on a super efficient plane because it's full from Japan and I'm here in seven hours. And the plane's full of everything and it's loaded super efficiently. So I think that whole dynamic of, you know, we're stuck in a, a tiny city, all we can do is do the best we can, right? Otherwise, we just don't feed anyone. And it's more about efficiency more so than maybe the other definitions that people apply to sustainability. These definitions, if people want to follow them so strictly, they need to first look at their own life before they start poking. In Singapore, there's, we don't have an option. We just have to do the best we can. And you know, when a product comes in, we have to use all of it and make sure it all gets used. And our restaurant, we serve a whole leek. We don't serve the two best bits of the leek. We serve the whole leek. We serve the whole fish. We don't portion, trim, and discard. So, you know, a lot of those things we do the best we can. We source from ethical places. And yeah, so we we do what we can in our control and push what we can and say no to things that we don't agree with. You know, that's the steps that we can take at the moment. With the bakery that you guys opened, was that just born out of COVID or was that something you always envisioned doing? Because your wife runs that now, right? She was the first one that worked in essentially the bakery. We've been baking our bread since day one. And whether it's buns, bread, tarts, which she's famous for, uh, or whatever it was, we've been doing it. And then over that time, we built up a network of other restaurants that sort of were taking the product. And then we had some guests that would be like, hey, can we get X, Y, Z? And then over COVID, it sort of like, you know, bakery became this huge thing, right? You know, donuts, tart, bread, whatever. And so we obviously had to pivot and maneuver and we pushed a lot of our team into the bakery and it sort of really flourished. And so coming out the back of it, we thought there was a business there. The burnt end sellers, is that mainly just geared towards organic Australian wines? Like, is that kind of the vision? 
not necessarily organic, definitely Australian. And the reason is when we opened is uh, we only had two wine fridges. We had an international wine list. And like in the first two weeks, no shit, every fucking table complained that we didn't have the right vintage or they liked the fucking vineyard next door. And so we were like, you know what, fuck this. Let's just do an all Australian wine list. Obviously, we kept champagne, port and sake. So like specific genres that, you know, can't be matched. But we believe that, you know, there was enough variety and production in Australia that we could offer something that was really good for guests to try, even if they didn't know about it. And so what that meant is we, you know, we needed to reach out to suppliers and set up these channels for bringing in their wine. And so it's literally just been born. You mentioned earlier, you know, staffing challenges, was kind of doing some reading. I don't think you guys have ran into too, too much, at least compared to you know some of the other restaurants. But how has, you know, staffing in the hospitality industry been you know, in Singapore since COVID? I actually think it's been quite interesting because I think in the pandemic and then coming out of the pandemic when the world was booming, everything tightened up. You know, no one wanted to be in hospitality. No one wanted to work the hours. No one, no one wanted to get the money. So they all took grab job jobs like Uber or whatever or a tech job or didn't work because felt money was so easy. And then, you know, over the last couple of months, you know, inflation skyrocketed. So everything's costing a fortune. Interest rates have gone up and there's really feels like there's not as much money around. It seems all of a sudden people are coming out of the woodwork and wanting to work in hospitality and restaurants again. So it feels like it's getting better. But for a while there, it was like no one wanted to work in our industry. A lot of restaurants want to improve, you know, their conditions for employees, mental health, hours, work environment. But it's kind of hard to figure out where to start. I mean, that was something that you kind of took on too as well for, you know, as you've expanded from one restaurant to, you know, your restaurant group, I think is like seven properties maybe in it, six or seven, something like that. So with all those people, you know, where did you start with, you know, wanting to improve all that stuff as you have, but did you have a specific thing you wanted to start on first or was it just feedback from everybody as to what they were looking for? I think it's tough because... You know, I don't want to be a restaurant or a restaurant group where mediocre is okay. So I want to have a team wants to achieve. The only way to achieve is to work your ass off, right? I think Kobe Bryant had an interview that I heard a little while ago where he's talking about the training of his teammate versus his training. And sort of his summary of it was over five years, I trained twice as hard as everyone else. How the fuck can they expect to be as good as me? If you're not working, you're actually not getting better. But if you need time to look after yourself and you you need that downtime to sort of recover and clear your head and sort stuff out, you talk to us, we do it. So it's that balancing act of like, if you need something from us to look after yourself every time. But in the meantime, our belief is we want everyone in the restaurant to be fucking good at what they do. And if you think coming in for 40 hours a week is going to get you really good at your job, fucking not. Nowhere in the history of sport or elitism of whatever you do comes with a 40-hour work week. I'm very conscious of I don't want to be that place where you can roll into work and think that mediocre is okay. Jordan had the same thing. You look at anybody who's at the top tier of their craft, especially in athletes like Jordan and Kobe, they all had this singular mentality almost in a way where they were like, I want to be great at this. And that's the only thing I care about. And you reach that pyramid at the top of the pyramid. You know, that's your ultimate goal. You might piss off a few people along the way, but that's life. Do you still do a bunch of uh, food events around the world? I mean, you've done stuff in San Sebastian, Melbourne, Hong Kong. Do you still travel and do all, or did COVID kind of kibosh all that stuff? Next year, the schedule's almost already full. It's like the greatest joys of cooking is being able to travel and see new things and experience new things and meet new people and see new products. And to do pop-ups and events and stuff is the best opportunity to get those experiences. So yes, you, you might not be that elitism, like perfect, perfect, perfect. But I think the benefits of what you get out of it is, from for us, it's worth more. It's kind of the never stop learning almost aspect like well unless you think you're the messiah that's kind of how you stay sharp too right i mean you know because if you're just working in the restaurant every day i'm curious if you don't know you you never know right so you got to get out and have a look what was the biggest change for you going from running one restaurant to a restaurant group time management because i still i'm still 95 percent at the restaurant 
you know, just got to be a lot sharper, a lot lot faster. And, you know, when you need to deal with things, you got to be a bit more organized and pre-planned. So you're coming up on like a decade having a restaurant in Singapore. How has the hospitality, the food and restaurant industry in Singapore changed since you've been involved? And where do you see it headed? Is there anything that you think still needs to change? Or Yeah, look, I, th- I think Singapore is going to continue to grow and evolve going forward. And it's like one of the fastest moving cities in terms of food because it's so competitive and so expensive to set up that if you don't hit the nail straight away, you can dig yourself a big hole really quick. And I just think what's coming in is like a lot of quality, whether it's like bottom end, top end, middle end, left field, that, you know, whatever's coming out. And we're so open-minded in Singapore with what we can eat, drink, and be at that who knows which iteration we're going to take next, but it's definitely going to be exciting because everything's accepted. Everything's open-minded as long as it's good. What's next for you professionally? I read uh, that you had plans for a brew pub at one point, but I think those got kind of put on hold. Is that something you still want to do or... It's still something we want to do. We're, we're working with a, we've sort of spoken to a brewer that we're, we're super excited to sort of work with. And we just touchy feely, have a look at what's happening and, you know, keep working with them and see what we need to do. And if it comes off, I think it could be super exciting because, you know, beer and barbecue, they're much else that's better. So this next question comes from the previous guest on our podcast, Chef David Willux, who was the chef owner of the Baker's Table and also the Baker's Table Bakery here in Cincinnati, Ohio, just down the road. If you could be on any beach in the world with any musician who's either dead or alive, what beach would it be? What musician? And what are you drinking? City Beach, which is the beach I grew up in, in Perth, Iggy Pop, and uh, Mezcal. What's a question you want to leave behind for the next guest? It can be anything. If you had one meal to cook and it was a barbecue meal, what would you cook and who for? This next question comes from one of our listeners. They wrote in, what's the biggest difference in cooking styles between Perth, Sydney, and Melbourne? I'll start with Sydney. And I'd say that if you're going to classify it, Sydney would definitely be uh, slightly on the more premium and refined style and side of things. Melbourne is a lot of cool, trendy, fun venues. And Perth has a long way to go. To put a disclaimer on Perth, though, I, I was there in October and we did have some really good meals. But if I was going to separate the way that they need to form, and it's not necessarily the people cooking, it's also the guests and the way they eat. Because they obviously drive the sustainability of restaurants in the city, right? From Perth to Melbourne, was that like a six-hour flight? Yeah, five, five or six hours, I think. Basically from Boston to LA. It's a big drive. So we got a handful more questions for you. We ask these to everybody who comes on the podcast, a nice compare and contrast across all the episodes. There actually is one new one in here that we haven't asked before that we added in for the new year. So first question though, who was the biggest influence on your cooking career thus far when you look back on it? The biggest influence would have to be Victor from Asadoy Chibari and, and purely because he was the guy that sort of showed that barbecue can be a real restaurant. And without that, we wouldn't have burn ends. What's one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Fire. Restaurant you'd recommend that isn't your own? Scenario I usually give, so it's going to be Singapore. Person gets stuck at the airport, you know, flight gets canceled, they're stuck overnight, they reach out to you, you you guys are closed. Hey, where should we go eat? You point them in this direction. I would probably say go have a chili crab experience at uh, Sinhoi Sai in Tiong Bahru. Bucket list travel destination and bucket list restaurant. So a place you have not been to, you still want to travel to, and then also a place you have not eaten at, but you still want to dine at one day. Definitely want to go and explore Brazil because I've never done it. Restaurant that I've never done, probably be ultraviolet. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? Maybe the extraction catching on fire. It's pretty crazy, right? What's the extraction? The exhaust system. I think that's pretty crazy. Is that just because it's so hot, so much heat coming from the oven? No, the fucking builder fucking broke a hole in our uh, in our extraction outside. And so he broke the seam, tried to silicon it up. Instead of being a oxygen-free environment, it was oxygen and silicon and fucking... He basically just threw air on your fire. We're very good with our maintenance of them, but this builder came in and like broke it because he was fixing the roof or something. And uh, next thing we know, we got a fire. Food or drink guilty pleasures or anything, candy, fast food, whatever that you know is pretty unhealthy for you, but you just can't help yourself. 
my biggest problem is, is if there's nice food around, I just eat it. Doesn't matter what it looks like or where it's from. If there's something there, I, like my guilty pleasure is not being able to stop like tasting or eating. I guess it's, uh, you know, we get the roti prada dropped off in the morning or we get the siu mai dropped off in the morning and I don't need to eat because it's there. I'll, I enjoy tasting. What was the other one? Drink. Yeah. Is there anything? What was the other one? Drink. Pretty partial to a mezcal Negroni at the moment. Pretty partial to it. Favorite Instagram account you follow? I quite enjoy the Fuck Jerry. I guess that would be one that pops up quite regularly that I get a bit of enjoyment out of. What is one cookbook that everyone should own? The Harold McGee, Science Behind Food and Cooking. Favorite dish thing you ever cooked, created? You know, kind of looking back on your career, you can point to this as almost like your aha moment. You knew that you could be a professional chef one day after kind of making this. Definitely wouldn't have one. Some people don't. I still question that every day. I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan. Not everybody is or was. Uh, if you were, is there a moment episode scene uh, about him that stands out to you? Or if you weren't, is there anybody else who was a TV culinary personality, Emerald, Julia Child, somebody that you kind of gravitated towards when you were coming up through your career? Anthony Bourdain was pretty pivotal when I first read it. I was kind of like, whoa, this is like, maybe I wasn't as hardcore as him. Well, I definitely wasn't, but a lot of it resonated. Then going through and with his TV series and stuff, it's kind of like very relatable for what I'd assume to be a lot of young chefs. Where can people find you? Social media, website, reservations, plug everything. Don't find me for reservations ever. Social media is dpinto, D-P-Y-N-T-O. And then our website is burnends.com.sg. And you guys are open Wednesday through Saturday or Tuesday to Saturday. And then lunches are Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And obviously the bakery around the corner and everything. And bakery is Thursday to Sunday, eight till four. And reservations are highly encouraged. For the restaurant, highly encouraged, but you can always try your luck. And if we've got seats available, we'll generally always fit you in. This was awesome. You know, I've wanted to have someone on, you know, I was working in Singapore for a while. It was just a cool experience. You know, my wife had been there a bunch of times. Yeah, she's like, you know, when do you think we'll go? And I was like, I don't know. Like, we have a six-month-old, so it's like, that's a long flight. It's a big flight without one. Because I remember going and, like, you get to Japan and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm almost there. And then, like, you see the board and you're like, wait, I got another seven hours? Hopefully, we can get you into the restaurant next time you guys come. If you go through Narita, you can go have sushi. And the sushi there is actually really good. That was the first time I'd been to the Narita airport. So it was just like, I was just trying to figure out where stuff was. Like, I just want to find my gate and not miss my flight because like that's, that's going to be a problem. So we both definitely want to come back at some point. I mean, we got engaged there and everything. So definitely want to come back. And, you know, there's a bunch of new restaurants there and, and places that she's eaten at that, that I wasn't with her and stuff like that too as well. It's a great restaurant scene and it's kind of how we build our travels. So definitely be reaching out, you know, whenever uh, we decide to make that voyage again, but I know we will at some point. But if you ever need anything from us, you know, feel free to reach out. You know, we try and support everybody as much as we can. You wind up opening a new restaurant concept or something, want to talk about the idea behind it for 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Always an open invitation uh, to return to the podcast whenever you need. You know, this is kind of a quote unquote safe space for chefs. You know, that's kind of the way we designed it and everything. Can't thank you enough for jumping on uh, with the time difference and everything. And thanks to Sarah too, as well, for coordinating everything. Stay in touch and hopefully we'll be seeing you in the next year or two. And uh, I'll let you get back to the, the rest of your Friday. Yeah, definitely, man. Thank you very much. A big thanks again to Dave for coming on the podcast, taking some time out his morning over in Singapore to chat about his career and the burnt ends and different restaurants and all that stuff. So again, you can follow him. to a whole bunch of accounts. Um, we got them all up on his page on the website, but the primary ones you're going to want to look for are his personal at D Pinto, also at Burnt Ends Hospitality Group. That's all one word. At burntends.sg. You got at burntends.bar.sg, at burntends.sellers.sg, at burntends.bakery.sg. All the meat smiths, with the, if you type in meat smith, it'll come up. There's four different uh, handles for that. And also the ledge by Dave Pint. Um, it's just at the ledge by Dave Pint on there for the Maldives restaurant. If for some reason you might be traveling to the Maldives uh, anytime soon, at least you got a great restaurant there to check out when you're there. So it was awesome to talk to somebody from Singapore finally, working in Singapore. Like I said uh, at the beginning of the episode, in the intro, you know, had a great time there. 
really looking forward to going back. The food scene's exploded into this whole different direction over the past, you know, five years that the foundation was there, but now it's kind of reached this top uh, echelon area with the Michelin Guide stuff and World's 50 Best and, and all these different restaurant awards, which, you know, you can take with a grain of salt. But they do mean something to everyone. I think some more than others, but they all are still important in some capacity. So again, you can follow us on Instagram at Spoon Mob. Check out our website, SpoonMob.com, and make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. We are doing some feed updating. I posted about this on Instagram. Some episodes from our back catalog might show up in your feed as unplayable even though you played them or something like that. Or if you go back to listen to one of the old episodes, it might not work initially. We're updating our feed. We changed hosts at the beginning of the new year. So it doesn't really mean anything for you guys. You don't really have to do anything if you're subscribed to the podcast already on whatever app that you're using. It doesn't change anything for you. But we are uploading all the audio episodes again um, through our new host because we were having issues with our old host. Uh, They actually owe us some money that they're trying to not pay. So we're doing some stuff with that, um, taking care of that, but we no, no longer affiliate with them. So you sh- also shouldn't have a bunch of random ads dumped into the episode either too as well. That's all kind of been taken care of. We're with a new host. We're getting the feed update and everything. You might see a little glitches and stuff like that here or there, but any episode that's come out since the beginning of the year. So the Brendan uh, Miller episode, Dave Willex episodes, those are all on the new host. So there's no issues whatsoever. So all the latest episodes that come out are with our new host. You're not going to find any issues. It's the back catalog that we're dealing with right now. We're just getting new audio files uploaded. So that's all on the same host feed and everything like that. So we can track it and and all that stuff internally. But it's a lot of just behind the scenes stuff of the podcast. So just if you see something in your feed, if it's pops back up or whatever, just mark it as played or, you know, delete the download if it auto downloads on you or something like that. And it should just be kind of a one-time deal. If there is an episode that you're looking to listen to in our back catalog and for some reason it doesn't play, let us know. Shoot us an Instagram DM, shoot us an email or through the website contact portal. Just be like, hey, I'm using this app, this number episode. I tried to play it. It won't. I'll take a look at it right away and should be able to get it fixed. But by the time you guys hear this, everything should be taken care of. The only outlier is probably going to be Google Podcasts and any app that uses Google as its primary feed source. Google has a little bit of a delay with verifying new feeds and stuff like that. So I got that taken care of on Monday, but it can take a couple of days for them to get everything corrected on their back end. By the time you listen to this, it might be taken care of. It might not. But if it's not, hit us up. Let us know. I'll take a look at it. Um, it all should be taken care of uh, by the time the next new episode comes out on Thursday. As always, appreciate you guys listening. Uh, If you've been here for a while, thank you for your continued support. If you're new here, welcome. Hope you guys enjoy the episodes. Go through the back catalog. Check all that stuff out. There's some great episodes in there. We're going to try and do some Instagram posts, um, bring some of those past episodes back into kind of the forefront. That way, if people are new and they haven't noticed them or they kind of got lost in the Instagram feed or didn't go far enough back with loading episodes as we get to 100 here, they'll be able to kind of check those out if they're new and that'd be a first time listen for them too as well. We want to continue to highlight anybody who's come on the podcast because you know they help support us. So we want to make sure we do everything we can to support them. We love the what they're doing and we love the food that they're creating or the business model that they got or the idea that they're running with or whatever, whether they're a chef, a restaurant owner, sommelier, somebody within the hospitality industry, a purveyor, a cheesemonger, a chocolatier, whatever. So we want to see those people thrive and have success, not only in those ventures, but any future endeavors that they undertake too as well. So, but again, thank you everyone for your understanding, your support, and looking forward to new and great episodes coming out in the new.